Good morning. Welcome to the Common Hour. My name is Justin Hopkins, and I am the Assistant Director of the Writing Center, Senior Teaching Professor of English, and Chair of the Common Hour Committee, along with my co-chair this fall, Rachel Anderson Rayburn. I'd like to introduce our ASL interpreter, Emily Phipps. Thank you, Emily, for interpreting for us at Common Hour. Please note that if you need to change your screen view to include Emily as you watch, you can adjust the screen display mode in the small box labeled view towards the upper right of the Zoom window. You can also enable the closed captioning if you like. A very warm welcome to all. The Common Hour is an unique and inclusive program that brings the Franklin and Marshall College community together weekly during the academic year for culturally and intellectually enriching events. It is the only regularly scheduled event that unites students, faculty, and staff, and invites the larger community to join us. Throughout the pandemic, the Common Hour has continued to provide a gathering space and a source of inspiration, education, and compelling discussion for the FNM community and beyond. Next week's Common Hour is entitled Life with Disabilities, Journeys Through Childhood, Career, and Activism, presented by Judith Hoyman, international disabilities activist. We hope you will join us for that. Please follow Common Hour on our webpage, the Presence Events Calendar, and our FNM Common Hour Facebook and Instagram pages. During today's event, Zoom viewers can submit questions for our speaker via the Q&A feature. Please indicate your affiliation with the college if you like, but we won't share your name. And now I'd like to introduce the proposer of today's event, Sarah Dawson, director of FNM Center for the Sustainable Environment. Hello, oh, Sarah. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, to joining for joining us today. As many of you know, the Center for the Sustainable Environment has been working over the last several years to bring attention to a variety of environmental justice issues around the world. And in that vein, we're very happy today to welcome Paul Pazimino as part of our environmental justice speaker series in conjunction with the school's common hour. Today, Paul's going to speak to us about one of the most serious cases of environmental injustice in recent history. It involves the illegal dumping of billions of liters of toxic water by Chevron into the Ecuadorian Amazon the home of a variety of indigenous peoples, in addition to an enormous amount of the world's biodiversity. What has happened since has included one shocking turn of events after another, with headlines being made even in recent days. Paul joined Amazon Watch in 2007 and currently serves as its associate director. He has an MA in International Affairs from George Washington University. Since 1995, he's volunteered as Columbia Country Specialist for Amnesty International USA. Paul has lived in Chiapas, Mexico and Quito, Ecuador, promoting human rights and community development and working directly with indigenous communities. Paul's also an associate fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies and served on the board of Peace Brigades International USA. We're especially grateful that he's taking the time to join us today because right now he's coming to us from Capitol Hill where he's been involved with organizing the questioning of the leaders of Chevron and other fossil fuel corporations regarding their perpetration of major environmental and human rights injustices. And now I'll turn it over to Paul to tell us how he got to Capitol Hill and update us on the case as it stands today. Please help me in welcoming Paul Paz Emilio. Hi, thank you everybody. Um, especially Sarah for inviting me. And um, I really, it is, it is the most timely thing. We could not have imagined when we scheduled this talk that it would turn out happening simultaneously with one of the most important congressional hearings in recent history, which is the House Oversight Committee calling in the oil execs, as well as the head of the American Petroleum Institute um, and questioning them about climate denial, climate misinformation, and their global acts of destruction of our climate and putting them, putting their feet essentially to the fire. It's the first of what I expect to be several hearings and investigations 
but it's pretty amazing that it's happening today. And I encourage everybody to go online and watch after it's over. You can watch the YouTube copy of what's what's happening. Um, the case in Ecuador, and I and I actually want to show you a little clip about what happened yesterday. The case in Ecuador of Chevron, then Texaco, is the largest oil-related disaster in history. Um, the 16 billion gallons that you may have heard of toxic oil waste that was dumped into the Ecuadorian Amazon is actually just what Texaco admitted to deliberately dumping. But the real number is many times greater, probably well over 100 billion gallons of toxic waste. That dwarfs by much the Deepwater Horizon spill, the Exxon Valdez disaster, and to add insult to injury, even though those were horrible acts of negligence, this case was the deliberate poisoning of the drinking water of tens of thousands of people and the destruction of ancestral territory for many indigenous ethnicities for profit as a cost-saving measure. And I know some people have seen the film Crude that does a great job of explaining what happened, of showing the level of devastation of connecting you to the people that were harmed. And what I wanna to talk to you about is both a simple case and a very complicated case by design, essentially by Chevron and Texaco's design. Simple is the fact that Texaco was the first company to drill for oil in the Amazon. They went into, in the 1960s, they signed an agreement with the then very US oil friendly government uh, in Ecuador, military junta essentially, and got a license to drill for oil in the Northern Ecuadorian Amazon. Nobody had ever been there before. There were no laws protecting the people from their operations. And so seeing that as an opportunity, they decided it would cost $3 less per barrel if instead of extracting the, the cancer causing toxic foundation waters before the crude is drilled, and putting it into storage tanks and then re-injecting it into the earth, which was the common practice and the practice by law in the United States at the time, they simply dug pits into the earth and dumped the waste there, set up a system of gooseneck pipes so that when it rained, which it does of course daily in the Amazon, that runoff would go into local streams where indigenous peoples were fishing, bathing and drinking. They actually told the people who lived there, that oil was good for them, that it was like milk. They could rub it on their skin and it would have health benefits. And so over the course of decades, as the only operator of these of well sites, they deliberately poisoned the drinking water of 30,000 people. And then when their consortium ended in 1992, Texaco left, they signed a corrupt agreement with the government of Ecuador they paid $40 million for a sham remediation, which attempted to hide the waste in a small fraction of the close to 1,000 oil pits that they left. Imagine an area the size of the island of Manhattan. That's what they decimated in the Northern Ecuadorian Amazon. And then they spent $40 million to essentially push dirt over a fraction of those pits, plant some trees on it, and told people it was cleaned up and they could go and live there. And of course, communities did, they got sick, they died, their farms were destroyed, their, their livestock died, and Chevron basically wiped its hands of the entire thing and said, we're done, we're out of here. What happened next was that Stephen Donzinger and other lawyers went to see what happened and were shocked by the level of destruction and the fact that the government had not protected the rights of the people that were poisoned. This $40 million agreement that I mentioned specifically said that it did not protect Chevron from any civil liability. It did say that the government of Ecuador would not pursue Texaco, that they were accepting the $40 million. And when Donzinger and other lawyers realized what had happened, they helped the indigenous and other farmer communities of that area launch a class action lawsuit against Texaco in the United States, in the Southern District of New York, where Texaco's headquarters was at the time. 
And this is where we go from a very cut and dry case of deliberate contamination to an ongoing legal saga that really exposes the depths of corruption in the US government, in our judiciary, and the pressure and silence that Chevron, an oil company like Chevron can create when it decides to invest the maximum amount of resources to do so. The Ecuadorians spent seven years in the Southern District of New York petitioning for the right to try their case there and seeking American justice. They were denied after seven years of Texaco and then Chevron saying that the case must be in Ecuador, that it could not be in New York. And because the actions happened in Ecuador, they had to go back there. And ultimately Chevron won that argument. So despite the fact that every single day they were continuing to live with this pollution, which by the way, had Chevron done in California or in Texas or anywhere else, they would not have been able to wait seven years to begin a cleanup. Someone would have forced them to actually clean up while the suit was going on. But in, in Ecuador, the communities fought on being poisoned daily, waiting for New York justice. And then the case was rejected in New York. So communities again began over in Ecuador. Now, the reason that Chevron and Texaco wanted the case in Ecuador was because they knew they had a very friendly government there and they could essentially make it go away. But what changed between that time and when the case was refiled in Ecuador is that the government shifted, Rafael Correa was elected as president and he did not have a very US friendly approach. So they weren't able to make the case go away. The case was begun again in Ecuador. At this point, Chevron acquired Texaco. And it's important to note that not only does that make them liable for everything that Texaco did, but they also continue to use the Texaco brand. So if you see somewhere a, Tex a representative from Chevron say, we never operated in Ecuador, that was a different company. It's the same company. And for the purposes of the law, it's absolutely a company that they're liable for. So after eight more years, the Ecuadorian judge wrote a, de a decision that Chevron needed to pay $18 billion to clean up the toxic waste and to provide health costs for the communities that it had deliberately harmed. This wasn't a payout to the communities. The Ecuadorian people were not trying to get rich from it. It was simply the cost that was needed in order to clean up along with nine and a half billion of punitive damages if Chevron didn't apologize to the people of Ecuador within a couple of weeks of that decision, which came down on February 14th, 2011. Of course, Chevron did not apologize. And later the, the Supreme Court of Ecuador decided that the punitive damages in that decision were not constitutional because there was no, there was no avenue within Ecuadorian law to pursue those types of damages. So they cut the decision in half to nine and a half billion dollars. Chevron likes to say that the decision was cut in half because it was ridiculous and it was too much money. That is again, a fabrication of their PR firms. The reason was because there was no process in the Ecuadorian law. Nevertheless, nine and a half billion at the time, the most, the largest environmental judgment in history, a civil suit brought by indigenous and farmer communities against a US oil company, the second largest oil company in the United States, groundbreaking. Nothing had ever happened like this before. And it's really important to recognize that indigenous communities won. They took Chevron to court. At that point, they fought for 18 years in two different districts and they won a judgment. The case should have ended at that point. But Chevron's response was to say, we're gonna fight this until hell freezes over and then fight it out on the ice. We're never going to pay a dime. We don't think we should have to pay despite the fact that they admitted to deliberately causing the pollution in the first place. So the Ecuadorians were faced with having to pursue Chevron to enforce their judgment. And I apologize again, this is where it gets into the complicated side, right? Remember, it's a very simple cut and dry case, but Chevron has sought to make it so complicated that I can't even explain it to you in 10 minutes, right? We've been going for 15 minutes 
and I'm just getting to the beginning of their legal retaliation. Two weeks before the Ecuadorian judgment was issued in February of 2011, Chevron went back to the very same district in New York that had rejected the Ecuadorians when they sought to sue Texaco and filed a retaliatory RICO SLAP suit. SLAP is an acronym that stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. There are lawsuits that are not often intended to win. They're intended to silence. A corporation or a powerful individual brings in lawyers to attack a side that does not have the resources and files frivolous lawsuits to silence them or to intimidate them. Chevron brought a slap suit saying that Steven Donzinger and the Ecuadorians were part of an international conspiracy to extort money from Chevron and that they fabricated their case in Ecuador. Despite the fact that they had, remember, admitted to the deliberate pollution, and they found a very corporate friendly federal judge named Lewis Kaplan, who actually suggested they file RICO case, a RICO case. He assigned it to his own court. He denied a jury. And then he began to proceed to have a RICO case that specifically excluded any mention even of the word contamination. So Chevron got everything it wanted. It had a judge that it liked. It had no jury. It was back in the United States. And the discussion of the actual crime of what they were, had admitted doing was kept out of the trial. So this is the basis upon which Stephen Donzinger was sent to prison yesterday. And I'm going to get into the details of it. But before we get too much farther, I want to show you a really brief video clip of Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib yesterday, who understands the circumstances that I just explained to you. And this was her response. Thank you so much, Chewy, for your incredible leadership and courage to stand up to corporate greed. I'm also really pleased to be here with our amazing chair of rules committee, uh, Chairman McGovern, who's also here standing up with us, uh, not only for environmental justice, but real true accountability so that you understand that this behind you is your house. This is the people's house. Yeah. Thank you to everyone here today speaking on behalf of Stephen Donzinger and the people of Ecuador. Stephen is supposed to report to prison today and what will go down is one of the gravest miscarriages of justice in American history. Chevron has been allowed to purchase our courts and the White House and the Justice Department are silent. More than 800 days of home detention and six months in prison for a human rights lawyer who had the audacity to win a case against a major oil company. Right. We can say, quote, this is in America, but that's lying to ourselves. This is exactly what happens in our country when you dare to challenge corporate greed. The White House and the Justice Department must intervene here if our legal justice system is to be anything other than a facade for the rich and the powerful to secure their interest. And it's not just America. Dr. Greer's report found that Chevron has 70 serious cases of environmental and community abuse in 31 countries worldwide, owing over $50 billion in judgments and settlement debts. Chevron is a rogue company, and it is shameful. A planet destroying, I mean, they're literally destroying our planet and it must be brought to justice here and all over the globe. I have a message for Chevron. Their CEO, Michael Worth, who made $29 million last year poisoning our planet, is gonna be here tomorrow, so I know that they're listening. I want him to hear this. You can't arrest all of us, and you can't arrest the truth. There are more of us than there are of you. You poison this planet to make money, and we're gonna defend our planet so we can live. And we will win this fight. Yes. By my count more, Mr. Worth's 29 million is only 0.3% of what his company owes indigenous Ecuadorians. But it's a start. Write the check, Mike. Yep. Mark my words, this is a test case for corporate polluters, y'all. They need to know that our climate reckoning is now. It is here. They, they will have to pay for their crimes against the people in our planet. They think they found a path for escaping accountability and escaping justice.
but they've only just awoken up people. Justice for Steven Dazinger, justice for Ecuador, justice for our planet. Thank you. And again, I recognize now our Thank wonderful you. chairman of our uh, rules committee, Chairman McGovern. Thank you. Um, so what Rashia Tlaib said was really important, and that's why I want to talk to you about the next phase of this case. This is a test case, and there is a reckoning. And Stephen Donzinger is an example of what happens when you take on an oil company and win. So the case in Ecuador is important, not only because it set a precedent for destruction in the Amazon, which has been continued by many other oil companies. There are daily oil spills in Ecuador and Peru that are affecting indigenous communities. And it's important not only because it was the largest environmental disaster of its type, but the process by which Chevron has escaped accountability and payment at this point is a chilling one for any case that we pursue against the fossil fuel industry and large corporate interests in the United States. And there's a few key players in this process that are important to mention. As I said, two weeks before the Ecuadorian judgment, Chevron turned to a judge back in the same district called Lewis Kaplan to file these RICO cases. The law firm of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher are the legal geniuses, as I like to call them, fossil fuel mob lawyers behind this process. They have, they're proud to have what they call the kill step strategy, which is a method by which they can try to nullify foreign judgments to protect US corporations. What they did was fabricate a case of fraud, bring it to a US judge, bribed a witness to lie, and said that Stephen Donzinger ghost wrote the Ecuadorian judgment and bribed the judge to accept it. And that's a pretty devastating claim. When you say that a lawyer bribed a judge, that's about the worst thing that they could do. Yet the evidence that they brought to make that allegation was the testimony of a disgraced former judge named Alberto Guerra, who was paid $2 million in cash and benefits by Chevron in order to testify that Stephen Donzinger bribed him. He never offered any evidence. He never had the money. He even admitted after the trial in another case that he lied on Chevron's behalf and that he did it to get more money. But his testimony was accepted by Judge Kaplan and it was actually the basis upon which Kaplan found that Donzinger had committed fraud and that he had bribed a judge. And he said, the Ecuadorian judgment cannot be enforced in the United States. This happened after the, in 2014. That was upheld on appeal. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals never considered the evidence that Guerra had lied, nor the forensic evidence supplied by the government of Ecuador proving that the judgment was not ghostwritten, but that it was written by the presiding judge on his laptop computer saved 400 times over the course of months. None of that was considered by the appellate court or the Supreme Court of the United States. But importantly, that jurisdiction only pertained to the United States. So the Ecuadorians turned their eyes towards other countries to seek justice. They went to Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled unanimously that the Ecuadorian judgment was valid and they could seek to enforce it in Canada. A whole separate discussion that we could have about protecting corporations would lead to the fact that Chevron's subsidiary in Canada was also insulated from paying the judgment. But that doesn't mean that the Ecuadorian judgment wasn't valid in the eyes of the Canadian courts. The Canadian courts have been trying to protect the subsidiary of Chevron Canada, saying that its assets can be hidden essentially from the corporation in the United States. That's another issue about corporate accountability that we really need to work on. But what's important to understand is that when this Canadian decision came down, it very much scared Chevron because the last thing they wanted is this Ecuadorian judgment to be recognized by other countries as valid. They went back to Lewis Kaplan and they filed, they asked him to file contempt of court charges 
so that they could get more information from Stephen Donzinger about who he was working with to enforce that Ecuadorian judgment outside of the United States. And Judge Kaplan was very happy to comply with that. He issued contempt of court orders. He told Stephen Donzinger he must turn over his cell phone, his computer, and his email passwords so that the court could provide that information to Chevron. This is attorney-client privileged information. There's no way he should be forced to turn this information over to his greatest adversary in an ongoing case in Ecuador. And every impartial observer who's part of our judicial system, legal scholars, other lawyers, former judges have stood up and said that this was completely irregular and he shouldn't have to do it. So Stephen Donzinger told Judge Kaplan that he was going to go into voluntary civil contempt of court and contest those orders to a higher court, which is ethically the only thing he could do as a lawyer in that situation, because he would be violating the rights of his own clients if he didn't do that. Judge Kaplan was not happy with that process. And so for those of you who are considering going into law, take note about this, because you're gonna be reading about this for many years in US jurisprudence. This judge decided to file criminal contempt of court charges in a civil case in order to punish Donzinger to try to force him to comply with his orders before waiting for the higher court to agree or, or decline his appeal. So he went to the Southern District of New York and he asked the federal prosecutor to file criminal charges. And he is, the response he got was, no, we don't have the resources to do that right now. This is the probably the most well-financed district in the entire the United States. So that was clearly an excuse. They did not wanna file these charges. They could see that it was absurd on its face. Two times they declined. So then Judge Kaplan, who, by the way, I should tell you, I sat through his entire proceeding was overtly racist towards the Ecuadorian people, has a personal grudge against Stephen Donzinger and would often wax on about how oil companies in the United States shouldn't be subject to little countries like Ecuador coming after them. It, it, was, it was palpable, his disgust for the people of Ecuador and for Donzinger as their supporter. So he personally wanted to punish Stephen Donzinger. So when he was rejected by the federal prosecutor, Judge Kaplan hired a private prosecutor as a judge to prosecute criminally Stephen Donziger for contempt of court. And he picked a law firm that had been working for Chevron only a couple of years before. He picked an oil-friendly corporate law firm to criminally prosecute a lawyer in the United States. And that's a fundamental violation of his constitutional rights. When we as US citizens or anybody residing in the United States is brought up on criminal charges, it's the state that does it. Another individual or corporation can't bring criminal charges against you. They can file those charges, but the state has to prosecute you. And in this case, it was a corporate Chevron law firm prosecuting this lawyer for criminal contempt of court. But it goes even further, then Judge Kaplan violated the rules of the Southern District of New York and handpicked the judge who would oversee the criminal contempt charges, Loretta Preska, Federalist Society member, also has investments in Chevron as Judge Kaplan did. And he handed the case to, Ka to Preska and asked her to prosecute Donzinger. The first thing that she did was slap an ankle bracelet on Steve Donzinger, put him on house arrest and say that he, he was a flight risk because he knew people in Ecuador and spoke Spanish, which is absurd on its face. He had been trying this case at this point for 20 years, and he was all of a sudden a risk of fleeing the country because he faced petty misdemeanor charges that carried a maximum six month sentence. But again, this is designed to punish and intimidate. Not, it's not about justice, it's about targeting Donzinger and making him an example. So, for two years and two months, during which time they prosecuted criminally, Stephen Donziger was kept on house arrest. And then ultimately, Loretta Preska found him guilty, hit him with a maximum sentence, 
and then filed an order saying he had 24 hours to, to um, turn himself into jail after his appeal failed. She, she, she denied him bail at the same time. So when she denied him bail, he appealed the, that bail denial and he lost that. And then he was given 24 hours, which is why he turned himself in yesterday to a minimum security prison in Danbury, Connecticut. And now he's beginning a six month sentence and he's appealing that conviction. But by the time that appeal is decided, he will have served all of his six months. So the message has been sent. If you take on Chevron and win, they will turn to the US government. They will find the judges that will work with them. They will hire the law firms that will do their dirty work, that will bribe witnesses, that will do whatever need to be done to fight until hell freezes over and then fight it out on the ice. And the challenge, of course, that we face is that every step of the way, when those on Donzinger's side, those advocating for indigenous rights, those coming from Ecuador come to the United States, they're faced with this massive machine that includes public relations, political pressure, and they are up against the full force in many ways of the US government to try to fight for justice, which is why it has been so difficult for advocates like Amazon Watch, who by the way was targeted as part of this RICO case, to find allies in the government to take up their case. And that's where we get to the part where this is actually a victory for the Ecuadorian people and for justice. Because by targeting Donzinger the, to the extent that they have, by unleashing this monster of Kaplan on him, they have exposed the depths to which they are clearly punishing and attacking rather than seeking justice. Because had this been an issue simply about obeying the law and finding a decision under the law, Chevron would have stopped a long time ago when they won their RICO case. There's no need to destroy Donziger, to take away his law license, to lock him up in jail for failing to turn over information to the court. That is why two weeks ago, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention took up the case and ruled that Donzinger's confinement was arbitrary, a human rights violation, that he should not only be released, but compensated for the detention he spent for two years, and that there should be an investigation into the flagrant impartiality of these judges who have overseen his case. The last thing Chevron ever wanted is for the United Nations to go back into a case that they thought they won six, seven years ago and open it back up by saying there should be an investigation. The next day, Amnesty International issued an urgent action saying that Donzinger should be released. 68 Nobel laureates, the European Parliament, members of Congress, like you just saw in that presentation, have now stood up to say, this is a human rights violation and it is an emblematic case showing that if we don't stand up for the rights of Donzinger and advocates for environmental justice, then we can't move forward seeking climate justice and accountability from the fossil fuel industry or any large corporation in the United States. And that's where, in my perspective, they have overplayed their hand. And now, and I've been working on this case for 14 years with Amazon Watch, I've never seen the level of support that I have since the moment that the Ecuadorians won their judgment in 2011. That's why it's so important that we talk about this case, that other environmental leaders have it on the tips of their tongue when they talk about challenge the challenging the industry. The people that are on a hunger strike right now in front of the White House demanding that Biden take action on fossil fuels at, at the UN climate conference, they are talking about Stephen Donzinger. They know this is an example and the US government and Joe Biden has a choice to make. Is he going to support the people who are affected by the industry or is he going to defend the rights of corporations like Chevron who are deliberately polluting the planet? And lost amongst all of this legal battle and the fact that Gibson Dunn, Sword and Kissel, the, the firm that was appointed by Kaplan to prosecute Donzinger are all making millions and millions of dollars profiting off of this is the fact that generations of people in Ecuador have now died from the contamination that was there. And that's why when representatives like McGovern, 
who was also at the presentation yesterday at the press conference, they're standing up to say, this is not just Chevron's responsibility. It's the responsibility of the US government to take action, to make right what went wrong. They need to step in. They need to make sure a cleanup happens. And then, then they need to make sure that Chevron actually pays for it. And that can't be done if Steven Donzinger is in prison and he is criminalized for this work because the next lawyer won't stand up for those water protectors fighting line three or the Dakota Access Pipeline or to stop future oil spills like just happened off the coast of California. Every single one of those cases is at risk if we don't stand up and close the book on Chevron and what they did in Ecuador. Because again, remember, this was a very simple cut and dry case from the outset. They admitted to the pollution, the evidence remains there in Ecuador, and the people of Ecuador brought their case to courts and won a judgment that was upheld by every level of court in Ecuador and by the Canadian Supreme Court. So that's why when I see an opportunity to talk about this case, I jump at it immediately because it's not part of, the, of common knowledge yet. People understand the climate is changing. They understand that the fossil fuel industry is responsible, at least most people who aren't burying their head in the sand about it, but they don't know the particulars about what's going to happen if we take on that industry and we win. And so this class, the press conference that we had, groups like Amnesty International, Protect the Protest, Law Students for Climate Accountability who are focusing on Gibson Dunn, there's a multi-pronged effort now to identify and prevent the types of actions that Chevron has taken to silence those people looking for justice in Ecuador and trying to bring them to account for the climate change damage that they have done. Um, there are many things that I didn't get to touch on that, that are actually incredibly shocking when you delve into the details of how Chevron managed to try to win its RICO case, the underhanded tactics that they took, the illegal things that they did beyond even bribing witnesses, um, but I, I don't have enough time to go through all of that, unfortunately, today. I'll just say that if there is more that you want to learn about this case, um, chevrontoxico.com is a fantastic website that we have, which, which has many videos about it, including leaked videos from Chevron whistleblowers given to Amazon Watch showing their contamination, but also the details of the legal story behind how they orchestrated their retaliatory RICO case and why that slap suit is so important um, to fight back against for groups like Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Amnesty, and other groups that have been under fire for taking on corporate power in the United States. So I, I don't know if now is a good time to take some questions or if we have some that, that are already in, but I'd, I'd like to give time for that if that works. We do indeed. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing um, uh, this part of this story. It, it's mind boggling, really, um, to me, um, how big it is. Um, we have a question first from uh, a staff member. Um, uh, what can we as citizens do to support Stephen Donzinger and to pressure Chevron to take accountability? What can we do? Yeah, so I'm glad that that's the first question because that's very important. And I should have said that uh, at the end of my talk. Right now, um, if you go to freedonzinger.com, actually, there's a phone number to the Justice Department. Amnesty issued its urgent action, and they actually filled up the email addresses for the Justice Department and Merrick Garland. So they're looking for a new address, and they, they will update their urgent action. We need everyone to call the DOJ to demand that they intervene. And the United Nations decision is final. The U.S. government is compelled to comply with it, especially if the Biden administration wants to continue its stance of saying it respects the international community and human rights. Now, they've said they wanna make a break with the previous administration. They wanna show that the US government is going to respect human rights internationally. And this body has said Donzinger must be freed and compensated. So that's the, that's the call that's being made to the DOJ. There's actually a very easy way for them to do this. As I mentioned, Judge Kaplan hired a private prosecutor to prosecute these criminal contempt of court charges, which is why Donzinger's in jail. 
He's appealing that. If the DOJ resumes control over that case again, which it should have in the very beginning, it could drop those charges, not mount a defense of the appeal and Donzinger could go free. So we need the DOJ to tell the private prosecutor of Sword and Kissel, her name is Rita Glavin, to drop the defense of Donzinger's appeal and then he can get out of jail. It's a very simple thing for the DOJ to do. The next step is going to be open an investigation into the process that led to this type of judicial abuse because this won't be the first time this happens. But right now, call the DOJ, leave a message at that number that's at freedonzinger.com. And then if you want, um, if you go to Amazon Watch's Twitter feed, you'll see a link to the Amnesty Urgent Action. You can take action via email there if you'd like to do that instead. That's what we need to know that people to do first. Second, we all need to be advocates for this case. And that simply means explaining to people what happened when they talk about the fossil fuel industry and climate change, make sure they understand the largest oil related disaster remains cl un not cleaned up in the Ecuadorian Amazon and Chevron is responsible for it. So that Chevron starts to understand that they can't wipe away and hide the facts of what they've done and that people understand in the US that they're a global corporate criminal that has admitted to a heinous crime. You wouldn't let somebody into the discussion who had admitted to poisoning thousands of people deliberately to talk about how they should clean up, how they should repair the damage that they've done. You hold them to account and then you work with other people to prevent that from happening again. But the, the attitude that's taken by the press and by the US government has often been, let's talk to Chevron about what they did cordially as if they weren't already admitting to committing heinous crimes. That needs to shift. And that's because of public perception about who these people are, that they're contributing to the benefit of our society by providing oil and gas, when actually they're criminal enterprises that are profiting off of de deliberate destruction and greenwashing that under a guise of saying, we're helping to lift people under property, uh, under out of poverty. So just understand the fundamentals of that case when you talk about it and don't get swayed by Chevron's retaliatory response of saying they weren't responsible and the government of Ecuador should do something when they're actually fully responsible for everything that happened up to 1992. Oh, thanks for posting that number. Should I, is, does everyone see that 202-353? one five 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 and press option two to ask to leave a message for garland in the chat we have some websites and some more information for those who uh want to take some of these actions i wanted to follow up with um a question from a faculty member which um you mentioned um a, a further step in the future of holding um uh corrupt judiciary accountable uh for their actions what can we do about that? And that, that's a more general question, not necessarily what can we as individuals do, but what can yeah. be done? That's a yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to be so close to this and watch it play out and watch the judges completely dismiss or ignore these outrageous, obvious in, you know, co uh, corrupt acts and be complicit in them. There's very little that we can actually do uh, to a federal judge. Uh, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, two members of that committee, uh, White House and Markey, wrote a letter to the U.S. Administrative Office of, sorry, the Administrative Office of U.S. Courts, which oversees our federal judicial system, simply asking procedural questions about the irregularity of appointing a private prosecutor who had a clear conflict of interest, of appointing a judge and not assigning the case to them randomly the way Kaplan did when he picked Prescott. They didn't even get a response from that office. And these are sitting US senators on the Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary Committee hasn't even asked the question about it. And Jerry Nadler from New York, who is Stephen Donzinger's representative in Congress, would not pick up the phone when he was asked for two years plus to get involved in this case. Lo and behold, we found out that his son is a partner at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher the very law firm that perpetrated the RICO case, the slap suit against Donzinger. He has taken money from that firm 
Kirsten Gillibrand, who is Stephen Donziger's Senate representative, also took a lot of money from Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. So there's a lot of political pressure on the fossil fuel industry side to prevent oversight and accountability, especially in these types of cases. The only thing that we can do is continue to shine a light on this level of corruption and push our representatives to fight back and investigate judicial abuse. Because a federal judge can be impeached, but it is very rare that it actually happens. And in these types of cases, I believe we're going to be seeing more and more of this level of, of corruption as more cases against the fossil fuel industry make their way through the court system. So we need to keep on the representatives who are on these judiciary committees in the House and the Senate and then make it politically too costly for represent for people elected like Biden to not weigh in when they see this kind of abuse. The Justice Department can investigate it. Just like they invest, they're investigating the attack on the Capitol, just like Congress is now investigating climate change uh, misinformation, they can investigate this type of abuse, but it's gonna take members pushing, or people pushing the representatives to make that happen. Might also be worth uh, reminding folks um, that um, uh, voting uh, on uh, Tuesday, um, I believe um, uh, would, would be, a useful way to exercise um, your um, uh, your social responsibilities and rights. Um, we have a, a follow up question here, uh, also from a staff member. Um, do you have any particular advice um, that you would give to someone, uh, a student who is inspiring a uh, lawyer, um, a law student, um, or someone who is interested um, in business uh, from an environmental advocacy advocacy um, perspective? Anything in particular you would advise uh, a person like that to do? in terms of studying, training? Yeah, yeah, and it's funny, I was actually having a conversation yesterday with uh, Natalie Segovia. She is one of the lawyers who is not handling Stephen's appeal, Donzinger's appeal. She's part of the Water Protector Legal Organization that is supporting activists um, who and, and Native people that have been targeted for the protests at, at Standing Rock and other places. And, we were lamenting that the process in the United States for learning law is often completely separate from the realities and with which it's applied. You go to law school and you're simply learning the process of the law in the United States and not looking at how it's applied unfairly, how it leaves so many communities out, what, where the corruption is in this type of a case, for example. So it's really important that students push to have those institutions explore those broader questions. There's a group called Law Students for Climate Accountability. They were with us yesterday at the Capitol. They have started a campaign to ask students to boycott Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher as a start. They've rated, they've rated the biggest law firms on how they are with respect to climate change. And Gibson, Dunn, of course, gets an F, it's no surprise. But worse than that, they're going after those climate activists. So they want everyone to boycott Gibson Dunn. It's important to plug into groups like that who are involved in universities that are studying things like law, but also are involved in the real-time application of them. And there are so many organizations across the US, grassroots organizations that are advancing causes of climate justice that need allies who are working in the political sphere, in the arts, in law, in public relations. So wherever your strength or your interest is, I guarantee you the movement can take those skills and make use of them if you're willing to dedicate some of your time to being a part of those things. If you're um, going into business, for example, the, the idea of everyone's individual car carbon footprint that was an idea proposed by the fossil fuel industry to make individuals feel like it's our fault for climate change. Now, there's nothing wrong with living your life in the more ecologically balanced way. We should all do that, but that is not the solution. And by distracting ourselves with focusing on, am I recycling enough? Or is it bad that I shop for gas here versus there or that I don't have an electric car because I can't afford it? We need to be pushing corporations to not invest in the processes that are destroying the environment and not propose essentially greenwashing. We need to move the money 
out of fossil fuel industry and the, the industries that are destroying, that are deforesting the Amazon, which by the way, as you know, someone who's the associate director of Amazon Watch, I should mention to you, we are at the tipping point of ecological destruction of the Amazon rainforest. It has reached that stage. If we don't immediately roll back that tipping point, it will be degraded and deforested beyond which the point it can recover. If we lose the Amazon rainforest, we will not be able to stop climate chaos from happening. It will turn eventually into a savanna and, and the global weather system will be permanently disabled and we won't be able to recover from it. So stop, we need to get corporations on board with stopping the deforestation practices. That means we have to invest in things like reuse and recycling that actually is effective so that we can stop extracting more resources from these areas. But that's a longer term process and, I, and it's gonna take everybody. It's gonna take banks, it's gonna take industry, government and corporations. So when you're looking at these types of businesses, are they a B Corp? Do they have investment in fossil fuels and deforestation? And if they do, push them to get out of that and then be leaders in the direction of stopping the destruction and moving towards a more sustainable economy. That's a lot, that's a heavy lift. It's not easy, I'm not suggesting it's easy, but it needs to be part of the way we think. Just like, imagine we were all still trying to eradicate slavery in the United States. Everything that we did, whoever we did business with, whoever was in government, whoever we talked to, we would be saying to them, we can't support anything that is enabling the continuation of slavery. This is the same type of fight, the fossil fuel industry, is not only actually enslaving people, but destroying our environment. And it, the climate debate and the climate, not debate, the climate issue needs to be an element in every part of the work that we do and how we live our lives if we're going to get out of it. It can't be left aside as a topical issue. It permeates throughout everything we're doing. Um, I have a, a comment here um, from a, a staff uh, member that I wanted to share. Um, uh, the, the comment is this, thank you so much for explaining the case. As an Ecuadorian, I'm so grateful to know that many people keep fighting for justice, especially for the indigenous people of my country. I hope the truth wins and my country can recover from this awful contamination. Thank you again. Um, yeah, it's actually kind of scary right now in Ecuador because they have a new president, Lasso, who is very pro-oil and pro-U.S. government, and they are planning to establish military, military bases in the Amazon. Um, they're drilling for oil in Yasuni National Park, which is the most biodiverse part, place on the planet, survived the last ice age, and now Ecuador is exploiting that, and the government is trying to push it as their only method of creating revenue uh, for a, a nation that still needs a lot of support for people who live in poverty there. But that's again, a message that's being sold to them by the fossil fuel industry. The rest of the world needs to come together to support the people of Ecuador and to develop their country without destroying the rainforest and the, the, the lives of the indigenous communities that are living in areas like Yasuni, where by the way, there are still uh, indigenous peoples living in voluntary isolation. I have a question from a faculty member here. Um, what are the stakes or the possible outcomes of the hearing going on before the house? And you've talked a lot about uh, enormous global uh, species uh, stakes, um, but maybe a bit more about what could happen in these particular events in these days. Yeah, the house, the, the investigation of the house is hugely important because Look at the tobacco industry, for example. This has been compared in many ways to the fight that we had against the tobacco industry years ago. The, the suits that have been brought and won against large corporate industries like fossil fuels or tobacco are on behalf of everyone affected by them. You know, not just smokers, secondhand smoke, all the things that have that the tobacco industry did that harmed people and children. Having these hearings is an important part of the ongoing process to hold corporations like Exxon, Shell, Chevron, BP, criminal or uh, liable for their criminal acts and for their destructive acts. So Congress investigating them and beginning to look at how they have not only lied and misled people, but hidden the truth from courts is the method by which then we can go back to those places and then hold them to account in a court of law. 
But having these investigations by Congress, and again, this is just the first hearing, there will be more as they delve into how much did Exxon spend on deliberately misleading people on lobbying to hide their damage the fossil fuel industry was doing for decades. And while they were profiting off of it, how do we go, as Bernie Sanders would say, we need them to pay for the climate damage that they've caused. In order to go and get that money out of the hands of these corporations, we need to bring cases with evidence and information that is that comes out from these types of investigations. So that's why it's so important that it happened. I have a comment here from a faculty member. The degree to which the US justice system is collaborating with this makes me ashamed to be an American. I just called Attorney General Garland at the number which was indicated, and I encourage everyone else listening to do the same right now. Um, Thank you. The, uh, there was a, a, a talk on campus um, uh, yesterday uh, from one of the surviving uh, students who was shot in the Kent, uh, uh, Kent State uh, killing in 1970. Um, it's interesting the timing of that uh, particular talk, and then and then this talk, and, and comments like this. Uh, I don't have a question there; just just noticing that. Um, we have uh, not a lot of time left, and we do have a question about what brought you to this kind of work. What what was it that made you want to do this specific work? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, I went to Quaker schools, and um, I should say that. There's now Lancaster Friends, which is the, the first Quaker school, I believe, in Lancaster that my sister, Andrea Cardi, actually started. Um, so I grew up with a very strong social justice focus. And uh, Sean Cardi, her husband, is uh, you know, in, the, in the department at, at FNM, in the athletics department. So um, it starts with family. You know, I, I've had a, my family is from Ecuador. And I've been doing human rights work since the early 1990s. I worked with Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. When I went to work with indigenous communities in Guatemala and Chiapas um, in, the, in the early or in the mid 1990s, it really opened my eye to eyes to the fact that there's a really important connection between environmental justice, indigenous rights specifically, and human rights. And that a lot of the solutions to the challenges we face can be can be seen in looking at how communities are able to live in ecological balance with the world. And there are so many lessons we can learn from indigenous communities. 80% of the world's biodiversity is on indigenous lands globally. And they are protecting that on behalf of the rest of the world. The most effective way that we can pr protect the Amazon, for example, is by advancing the rights of indigenous peoples. This has actually been scientifically proven. So for me, it all came together with my focus on Latin America from my family's background, from the education that I had, and then wanting to confront this climate crisis and seeing that all those things came together in doing indigenous rights work. So my, my time at Amazon Watch is, is the perfect place personally for me to be um, because it allows me to focus on all of those things essentially simultaneously. That's, that's fascinating. and I. I... I, I would say thank you for the work that you're doing. I imagine that many in our audience would echo that uh, as well. Um, we have just a, a minute or so left. Um, uh, I would like to thank, um, uh, again, Sarah Dawson for proposing this event. I'd like to thank uh, Emily Phipps uh, for interpreting. Um, is there any, are there any final words that you'd like to share uh, before? I'm imagining you'll get back to watching uh, the hearings um, and I hope that, that others in the audience might also take the opportunity to watch those, but any final words in this last minute? Yeah, I would just you know, ask people, don't, don't set this aside, like realize this is playing out in real time and we all have a role to play in, in promoting justice for this in this case and other cases, but it really does, trickle down to use an unfortunate metaphor from this case to others that are like it. So, you know, follow Amazon watch on Twitter and on Instagram. It's just at Amazon watch. And you'll see what we're saying about this case in the fossil fuel industry and, you know, raise your voice where and how you can please, because there are so many organizations that are depending upon volunteers and students. And really the solution is going to be when students take action, because you know, my generation has done what we can, not enough, you know, I, I apologize on behalf of my entire generation, but it really is going to be the youth that lead us to the real solutions to this problem. So 
and, you know, feel your power and, and raise your voice in it, please. It does make a huge difference. Thank you so much again, Paul, for joining us. Thank um, you. Thank everybody uh, in the audience for joining us uh, and to encourage uh, you all to um, uh, join us next week uh, for common hour at this time. Um, and again, please, um, please reach out uh, to these organizations as you're led um, uh, and tune in to uh, the uh, hearings which are happening uh, as you're led. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day and a good weekend ahead. Thank you.